You're using a mic. Secondly, uh, you were being asked by Congressman Lee about Don McGahn and his refusal to fire or ask that uh, uh, special counsel be fired. And he didn't want to be compared to Bork and the Saturday Night Massacre. What did you think McCain meant by comparing the special counsel being fired for the Saturday Night Massacre to the role he was asked to engage in? And what was your reaction to the phone calls between the president and Mr. McGahn? Well, when I read the Mueller report and the details, um, my first reaction was that McGahn took the high road, acting more like uh, Elliot Richardson and Bill Ruckel's house, uh, and I thought that was admirable. He had said he would consider resigning, and he was yes. prepared his resignation. Is that correct? Yes. The report goes on to detail how trapped McGain felt. Quoting from page 86 of volume two, McGahn recalled feeling trapped because he did not plan to follow the president's directive, but did not know what he would say the next time the president called. McGahn decided he had to resign. Page 87 describes McGahn's phone calls later that evening with Priebus and Bannon. Priebus recalled that McCann said that the president asked him to, quote, do crazy stuff, and I clean it up. But he thought McGahn did not tell him the specifics of the president's request because McGahn was trying to protect Priebus from what he did not need to know. Ms. Vance, if McGahn had carried out the president's orders, would McGahn face legal jeopardy himself? So it's difficult to answer questions like that without knowing exactly what would have transpired. But there's an enormous risk that he would have. And at that point, there would have been both completed obstruction and a conspiracy to obstruct. Mr. Dean, as a former White House counsel, are these types of requests in the normal course of business? No. Mr. Dean, understanding the circumstances was Don McGahn's decision to ignore the call to get Mueller fired and McGahn's reaction to resign reasonable and appropriate, commendable. Yes. Mr. Dean, understanding your history as someone who was in a similar position but chose differently, what did you think Don McGahn was afraid of? Why did he feel the need to protect both his chief of staff and other advisors? Well, I think he's somebody who learned from history. And if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it, are we not? Exactly. Yes, sir. The following quote and questions may pose a parlamentary oh, risk. No. No, you don't, don't read it. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Ms. Ms. Vance, you said that, that there was a different standard, uh, that the collusion was in played sight, and that you said that, the, that we had to prove, beyond, to, when they brought a case, that they had to win it at trial and they had to win on appeal. Is that the same standard Congress would face in an impeachment hearing? You know, it's not, and that's a very good point. We've talked a little bit about whether a congressional inquiry would be a do-over of the Mueller investigation. And a congressional inquiry is very different. When prosecutors consider cases, they have to find a federal statute, a law that you all have enacted, and make sure that a defendant has violated, that they can prove a violation of all the elements of that statute. So here the notion of an, a corrupt act, a nexus, and corrupt intent. Congress doesn't have those same restraints. When Congress examines conduct in its oversight and its impeachment function, your jurisdiction, as I understand it, is much broader, and you could reach conduct that we might categorize as lawful but awful, something that would be so inappropriate for a president that Congress would determine it needed to be sanctioned. So kind of would we have a, a it's a different standard, but would the standard be kind of preponderance of the evidence instead of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? So I think that's correct, and that, that the way that you deal with impeachment proceedings is largely up to how Congress chooses to move forward. The standards that you set, the way that you define high crimes and misdemeanors, it's a process that's less cabined by existing statutory criminal law than the conduct of someone like a special counsel would be. Thank you. Page 89 of Volume 2 says, and this is directly from the report, substantial evidence indicates the president attempts to remove the special counsel were linked to the special counsel's oversight of investigations that involved the president's conduct and most immediately reports that the president was being investigated for potential obstruction of justice. And on page 90 of the report, it states there's also as evidence the president knew he should not have made those calls to McGahn. It goes on to say, quote, instead of relying on his personal counsel to submit conflicts, the conflict claims the president sought to use his official powers to remove the special counsel. Mr. Dean, do you agree and why? 
Well, I think it was inappropriate to use special counsel, or, or the, the uh, White House counsel, and White House counsel rejected uh, being so used. And Ms. Vance, as a former prosecutor, how would you evaluate the evidence presented in the report, and how does it compare to other cases you've seen prosecuted? So for prosecutors, when they evaluate evidence, you know, I think it's important just to be frank about this and to note that we're all people, right? We all have different backgrounds, different likes, different views, different politics. What prosecutors are trained to do is to check those beliefs at the door. So the office that I worked in had, I assume, folks who were Republicans and, and Democrats. We largely didn't discuss politics in the office. We look at the evidence through a very narrow filter. That filter is evaluate what the law says, evaluate the evidence that you have, search for the truth, and charge cases where you believe you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt the elements of a crime. That's how we have to look at the evidence in the Mueller report. And in some instances, Mueller investigates in volume two, 10 potential instances of obstruction of justice. In my judgment, some of those I would not indict but in at least three core areas, the areas involving removal of special counsel Mueller and the president's efforts to get Jeff Sessions to unrecuse and restrict the nature of the uh, investigation, there appears to me to be substantial evidence that would permit prosecutors to move forward. Thank you so much. I yield back the balance of my time.